So let's move on. Um, Professor Jeffrey Sachs, um, a very long bio, but I'm just going to highlight two things. Director for Sustainable Development at Columbia University in New York City and Director of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network and has been an important SDG advocate for the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres. A reminder that uh, we can pick up exactly what uh, Jeffrey has been saying uh, immediately afterwards, so please use your um, uh, question uh, capability on your whatever machine you're using so I can then pick up those questions very quickly uh, and we can have a productive 10 minutes or so after uh, he has spoken. Professor Jeffrey Sachs. We've already gotten started with a, a fantastic round of questions. Uh, clearly, this is a very sophisticated audience and a lot of pertinent questions about how to make sure that the investment process is actually for the social good. This is the basic question that we're addressing. What's the role of private investors? What's the role of government? How does impact investing, one part of this puzzle, fit into the larger challenge of making our societies work better? And that's what I want to discuss, trying to at least answer a little bit some of the excellent questions that have just been asked. So my title is not Impact Investing for Sustainable Development, but Investing for Sustainable Development. Investment is building our future. It's investing in our children, in their health and education. It's investing in our infrastructure, our transport, our power, our water, and so on. It's investing in our new technologies and our new industries. The challenge is for that investment to be for our good, not for our bad. Often, in a textbook, we say, well, let the market determine the outcome. But that's a pretty bad textbook, if you believe that. Because markets alone will never determine the right outcome of investment. They have a role to play, but only a limited role. To make sure that investment works for the common good, we have to do more than simply turn to profits or the markets. We want the economy to deliver what is often called the triple bottom line. We want the economy to deliver a high level of output per person or productivity, usually measured as the gross national product per person. That's probably the most observed statistic in the world. How high is the income level? But that is hardly a measure of well-being. It is a measure of economic output. But for well-being, we require at least two more fundamental ideas. One is that this output is shared in the society. If all the output is held just by the richest and we are living in, a, in an ocean of poverty, 
This is a moral disaster, a social disaster, a political disaster. And so at the United Nations where I work in uh, conjunction with my work at the university, the expression is leave no one behind. But we're leaving billions of people behind, by the way. Children are dying of poverty in a world of wealth. 260 million kids are not in school because their communities are too poor to even have schools and classrooms. It's a disgrace for a world that is $100 trillion a year of output. So we want social justice as a second consideration. And the third consideration is environmental sustainability. The market system will wreck our planet. I guarantee it. It's doing it. We have three massive environmental crises in the world. Human-induced climate change, the destruction of habitat like you see in the huge forest fires in Australia and Brazil, and the massive pollution that has gotten into our air and to our water and into our food supplies. So markets are failing to ensure social inclusion and environmental sustainability. The basic concept that I try to live by and try to preach, if I could put it that way, is sustainable development. It means economic development that is also socially inclusive and environmentally sustainable. Triple bottom line. Markets do not achieve sustainable development. Markets only achieve economic development. But market outcomes are unfair and environmentally unsustainable. That's why we need something more than a market economy in order to achieve what we want. So we're rich today, and the world is rich, $100 trillion of output each year. But billions of people are struggling with poverty. Five million children will die this year because they're too poor to stay alive. Five million around the world. It's a shame on our global society. And we are destroying the planet at the same time. That is why all of the world's governments, all 193 member states of the United Nations, adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. I hope these are a major topic at the G20 that you will host this year in Saudi Arabia. These 17 goals express the idea of the triple bottom line. They say, don't just get rich, end poverty, number one, end hunger, number two, ensure health care for all, number three, ensure schools for all, number four, and so forth. Environmental protection, stop human-induced climate change, number 13, protect the water, number 14, protect the land, number 15, and so forth. This is the idea of these sustainable development goals. They're very important because the world has agreed to them. It hasn't achieved them. It's easy to agree to things. It's much harder to achieve them. But at least the world's governments, all 193, have agreed to these 17 goals. They also agreed to the Paris Climate Agreement. Why is this so important? Because, as you know very well, last five years, the most recent five years, have been the five warmest years in human history. We are now 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than before the Industrial Revolution began. We are now at a higher temperature, ladies and gentlemen, on the planet than in the whole 10,000 years of civilization. 
The last time Earth was as warm as it is today was 115,000 years ago. And the sea level at that time was six to nine meters higher than it is today, meaning that we have already set in motion a massive rise of sea level unless we stop the global warming. We are in the midst and we are courting catastrophe if we don't change direction. This is very hard to do. It's a big challenge for this country because you are the center of the world oil and gas industry. And yet we know we have to take action decisively to save Earth. And so this is also part of sustainable development. To achieve sustainable development, it's not just investors. It's not just the market. It is government. It is business. And it is investors all have to support, promote, achieve the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Climate Agreement. So it's a good question to ask yourselves and your company, what are you doing about the SDGs? Maybe you're hearing about them for the first time right now, but I hope not the last time. What are you doing about the Paris Climate Agreement? You might say, well, that's not my business, or that's too inconvenient, that's too hard. But we can't afford that approach, because we will absolutely wreck the planet if we do. We will create havoc on Earth. The beautiful creation that we saw in the opening we will destroy. That plant will not emerge from the earth because there will not be the moisture in the soil. This is the path that we are on right now. And to achieve our goals, <coughs> we need government, business, and investors to be aligned. Think of this challenge in six big categories, if you will. One is education, gender, and inequality. That is, leave no one behind. Make sure that every child, every girl, every boy is educated, trained for a productive future. Number two is health and well-being. Let's make our societies healthful. Look at the coronavirus, how in just Days, the whole world is turned upside down by an emerging virus. We need public health facilities. We need epidemiology. We need clinics all over the world. But I can tell you there are a billion people who have no access to basic health care. What's going to happen when the epidemic spread there? Disaster for them, but disaster for everybody. The idea that, oh, we're safe because we're rich. Others may not. This is the illusion of modernity. Nobody's safe when there is so much exclusion from even the most basic health care. The third big category is clean energy. Clean energy means energy that does not release carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and industry that does not pollute. We are desperately far from this. This year, 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide will be released by burning coal, oil, and gas. And then the forest fires will release billions of tons more because now we have a vicious circle, warming leading to destruction of forests and release of, perm of uh, carbon dioxide from the melting permafrost. So we're really in an absolute emergency. The fourth is sustainable use of our land, our water supplies, our oceans. 
because, again, greed has gotten ahead of sustainability. We're fishing more than the fish can supply. We're cutting down the rainforests. For what? We're already rich. Do we have to destroy the earth in the process? The answer is no. The fifth big category <coughs> is, of course, creating cities that work because we are increasingly an urban global civilization. We're now 55% urban, but we'll be 70 or 80% urban within the next three to four decades. But our cities are filled with air pollution. When we were in New Delhi just a couple of days ago, you could hardly see out the window. The air pollution is so thick. You have massive sandstorms that also come from the drying of the surface waters. And so we need to make our cities viable. And the sixth area is mastering the digital technologies so they don't master us. Our new digital technologies can work for healthcare, for education, for good governance, or they could become cyber warfare, or they could become uh, instruments of hot war. This is our threat. And so turning these technologies to proper use for the people is this sixth challenge. Now, what is the role of government in all of this? Government has three basic roles. First, it's to invest in the new sustainable technologies. The most important investment in this country in this regard is the solar energy because Saudi Arabia and the Gulf should be a world solar superpower, providing clean energy for the world. The government should take the lead. Second, it is to provide social services for all, especially health and education for every child, for every person on the planet. And third, it is to regulate businesses. In the United States, businesses regulate the government. They tell the government what to do. You have to vote for this, you have to deregulate us, because business runs our government in the United States. It should not be this way. Government should control business. To say businesses should not pollute, should not destroy the environment. Why is our government deregulating everything? Because business runs our government. And you end up with an environment that is destroyed. And that's what happens when government loses its way. Business should not run government. Government should regulate business. China, for example, is pioneering many sustainable development technologies. This has gotten the United States very upset, by the way. But China is right about this, because this is an area for government leadership to promote new technologies. And this is an area where your government has a big opportunity and responsibility to promote alternative energy, especially solar power, which is in such plentiful potential in this country. What should business do? Business should align with the sustainable development goals and with the Paris Climate Agreement. But the first thing to do is know what they are. Most businesses don't know about the SDGs and about the Paris Agreement. So the first thing is self-education. And then I encourage businesses to ask four questions of themselves. When you analyze your business, four questions. First, is my product really beneficial? Because many companies produce many profitable products that are not beneficial, that hurt society. They create addictions, they create social harms, they create pollution. The whole American fast food industry is killing us. Not all of it, but much of it. Because the products are not healthful. And so the first question is, are the products beneficial for society? The second question is whether our production process is sustainable. If your production 
releases a lot of carbon dioxide into the air or uses water unsustainably or pollutes the environment, then it's not sustainable. The third is the global value chain. Every business is part of a value chain. <coughs> One should ask, are our suppliers sustainable? Let me give you an obvious example. Take our, our smartphones, OK? They all have batteries in them and other electronic components that use cobalt. Where does the cobalt come from? It comes from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Who makes the cobalt? Child labor, bonded labor, in the most horrific conditions in many cases. This is not a sustainable supply chain. This is the responsibility, in my view, of Apple and others. It's part of their supply chain. We can't have our world economy built on slave labor or bonded labor or child labor. And so this is responsibility globally. And then finally, is the company a good corporate citizen? What does it mean to be a good corporate citizen? It means to obey the law. It means to be transparent. It means to report on activities. It means to pay taxes. That's an unpopular idea in the United States. So we have tax havens everywhere. But this is something that we need to have. Taxes are absolutely necessary for civilization. What should investors do? Two big things. Sorry, you haven't heard anything I've said, I'm afraid. Two big things that investors should do. One is don't do bad things. Don't do bad things. Don't invest in harmful activities. Or what the doctors say, do no harm. The second is do good things. The most important is do not do bad things. That's even more important than doing good things. So there are two categories that are important. First, ESG investing, environment, social, governance investing. That says do not invest in companies that are doing bad things. This, to my mind, is the most important thing. Even aside from charity, even aside from philanthropy, even aside from impact investing. Stop doing bad things. So ask about your companies. Are they aligned with the Paris Agreement? Are they aligned with a clean environment? Are they aligned with social protection? In other words, are they creating harm or good? If you want, I'll give you a list of companies creating harm. Many of the biggest companies create lots of harm in this world. They make epidemics. Uh, they make uh, obesity and ill health. They create addictions. They create pollution. And they're the biggest name companies. They're not good citizens. They evade their taxes. They lobby government to do terrible things. I would say don't invest in such companies. If we obeyed that rule, we would actually have a better world. We would tell the companies, behave. You may have seen that the US Business Roundtable this year said, oh, it's not just the shareholders, it's all the stakeholders. Well, I'll tell you a secret. They don't really mean it. Not yet, because they're all wanting to make money too much. Too much greed, not enough attention. That's why it took them so long to say, oh, there are other stakeholders. I could give you lots of names. Maybe it wouldn't be polite. But our biggest banks are investing in environmental destruction even as they sign the new business roundtable statement. So it's a kind of hypocrisy or a kind of show. But we need real ESG investing. Then comes impact investing. What does it mean? 
It means something more than do no, do no bad. It means accept a lower return to have social benefits that don't hit your own balance sheet. That's a choice of wealth holders that invest in such funds. Why do that rather than philanthropy? Because it is a kind of blend of philanthropy and business. It makes sense because many good things should be in the form of business. And so blending philanthropy and business can make sense. And that's why impact investing is an important category. But I would put it together with ESG investing, which is do not invest in the harmful activities. Because we should not make profit at the cost of others. Unfortunately, this is not a popular view. People say, well, if, it's, if I can get away with it, I'll make money even if it hurts someone else. That's a very common view on Wall Street. It is absolutely wrecking the world. And it, is, it should not be allowed, but even if it is allowed, it is intolerable. It is absolutely unethical. So this is my point. ESG investing, do not invest in companies and sectors that are misaligned with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement. We have a divestment movement in the United States. It says stop investing in new fossil fuel generation. You are the fossil fuel capital of the world because this region is the biggest region of hydrocarbons. This is not a simple challenge for you. It's the most complex economic challenge your society faces. But it's absolutely a real challenge because we cannot continue with the fossil fuel-based economy. I'm sure everybody here knows that the climate science is real and that the climate change is dire. If you don't know it, let me just say it is real. And the disasters are dire. And it pays no sense to deny it. People do deny it, but usually because they're paid to deny it. But the risks are absolutely profound and need to be addressed. For impact investing, it is even going beyond. But that is a choice to accept a lower private return. That's different from the ESG. The ESG says don't accept a return based on harm to others. Impact investing says, accept a lower return if it does good to others. Bless you if you do it. It's smart to do it. It is wise to do it. But it is a different kind of choice. And it can make a lot of good in the world. But I do think there are at least three questions for impact investors. First, are the target businesses really aligned with the SDGs and with the Paris Agreement? Second, are the social and environmental benefits, not the market benefits, not the profits, but the social benefits, truly high enough to justify the lower market returns? And third, shouldn't these activities be left to government? Because many things are really the responsibility of government. And I want to emphasize that because I feel quite strongly about it. The financing of health care, education, and basic infrastructure, in my view, should be mainly the responsibility of government rather than the private sector. Why? Because every single person on this planet deserves a decent education. Every person deserves health care just because they're human beings. Everybody deserves access to basic infrastructure. So in my opinion, this is not a social good to be brought by business. This is a basic responsibility of society. It is a basic human right. 
My country does not believe this, by the way, or my government, or uh, my, the political system. It says leave things to the market. And so we have so many people suffering, even though we have $60,000 per capita income in the United States, we still have poverty. But I think that's a kind of cruelty, not really sound. So I don't want social businesses solving those problems. I want the U.S. government taking responsibility for what is a core responsibility of government. And I think that this is a question we might discuss even more. Social business is nice in these areas, but I don't want to take away the responsibility of government to do what we need to do to ensure that nobody is left behind. Let me close by saying that Saudi Arabia's greatest sustainable development challenge is certainly the energy sector. This is a massive, massive challenge for your society because it is just actually, and I have to put it this way, it's just unfortunate chemistry Oil and gas has helped build the modern world. The fossil fuels made possible our wealth. They made possible the modern world. <coughs> it's just bad luck that it turned out because of quantum physics that carbon dioxide absorbs heat from the Earth and warms the planet. It's an accident of physics. It's not a moral accident, it's an accident of physics that we cannot rely on hydrocarbons like we thought we could. So we only have a short period of time, 30 years to decarbonize the planet. And this is a global responsibility. My view is that since Saudi Arabia is the world's low-cost producer, of oil, you should provide the remaining oil that we need. The rest of the world should stop any new development of fracking or deep sea oil or Arctic oil. We don't need that extra oil. You have more than enough. And you can be the low cost provider, but also we need to phase out the dependency on oil and gas in the next 30 years. Fortunately, this country is blessed not just with one energy source, but with many, and especially with the greatest sunshine in the world. We see it when we look out today. This is a country blessed with solar energy. You could power the whole world with solar energy. We just need the transmission lines. And interestingly, those transmission lines now can carry your high-quality solar power thousands of kilometers. You could be the solar power for Europe, for China, and for India, by the way. Because high-voltage direct current lines can connect green electrons with the whole world that is in need. So this, I believe, is the most important sustainable investment challenge for this country. I know that the government is moving in this direction, looking at these options, and you're already making major investments. I encourage you to continue in this leadership. This would truly be world-changing and even world-saving. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the privilege.